Hi, everyone, and welcome to CCAG's Climate Conversation Series. I am Mitzi Jonelka, a full-time climate justice activist based in the Philippines, and I'll be leading our conversation today. I have the great pleasure of welcoming our two guests, Johan Rockstrom, Director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and Professor in Environmental Science at the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University, and Dr. David Abura, Founding Director of Cordio East Africa. Thank you both so much for joining me. And the subject of our conversation today is about planetary boundaries. We know that our planetary resilience is failing, and Johan, as part of your research with the Stockholm Resilience Center, you propose nine planetary boundaries, and these include biosphere integrity, fresh water availability, nutrient pollution, and climate change. And as boundaries are crossed or broken, we run the risk of causing large-scale, abrupt, or irreversible environmental changes. And worryingly, the center's latest analysis is that we have already transgressed six of the nine planetary boundaries. And so if the Earth was a patient, it would be very, very unwell. Um, and I guess that's my first question. Like, Johan, how did you establish the nine boundaries? And how has the state of the boundaries changed since they were established? It's actually over 30 years of, of tremendous, I mean, really fascinating scientific advancements in global sustainability and Earth system research. The evidence that we've entered the Anthropocene, that we're now putting pressures and being the dominating force of change at the planetary scale. All the advancements in Earth system science, where we today understand that our planet is a, is a very complex, self-regulating system where the living biosphere, nature, interacts with uh, the cryosphere, all the ice sheets, the atmosphere and the climate system, the oceans and the big, large geosphere all the soils and rocks around planet Earth. And then finally, that we have also so much evidence today that the Earth system is not only this complex self-regulating system, it has tipping points. It has big so-called tipping element systems that if you push them too far, the system will irreversibly shift from a state that can dampen and reduce impacts under stress. But once crossing tipping points, it would not only self-amplify change, meaning drifting away from the state that can support humanity, but also would reduce human well-being. So these three pieces of science were brought together and referenced against another breakthrough, which is that we have now ice core data showing that the past 12,000 years, the Holocene, is a uniquely stable state of the planet. And we package all this together, it raises the big question, what are the systems that regulate the stability of the planet? now that we are at risk of destabilizing the planet. And secondly, how we went about this, Mitzi, was to invite scholars from all disciplines, ecologists, hydrologists, oceanographers, climate scientists, uh, cryosphere, ice scientists, and ask the question to turn every stone we have on what are the big biophysical processes and systems that we know scientifically contribute to regulate the state and the functioning of the Earth system. And out of that came, after three years of work between 2006 and 2009, nine planetary boundary systems. And that was first published in 2009 as a challenge to the scientific community. Have we got it right? And the, and the big challenge that we took upon ourselves was not only to identify the nine boundary systems, but also to, to attempt to identify control variables and quantify scientifically a safe boundary stay within it, you have a safe operating space, which gives a high likelihood of maintaining the life support systems on Earth and the stability of the planet, go beyond them, and you risk triggering irreversible changing and drifting away in a direction that would undermine and gradually, but irreversibly, undermine life support systems for humans, but all species on planet Earth. And there you have the framework. And it's been updated in 2015, and then we have a third update, which was just published a few months back in 2023. We've now been able to quantify all the nine boundaries, and just as you hinted, six of the nine boundaries are now outside of the safe operating space. And just to close the first intervention here, the way we, we um, go about this scientifically is to combine literature reviews, synthesis of science, but also modeling runs, looking at what happens if you transgress one boundary and how it affects other boundaries. So there are many lines of inquiry to come at the boundary definitions, but it should be also recognized 
that this is a really challenging science. There are still big uncertainties for some of the boundaries. We were actually able to quantify all the nine for the first time this year, 2015. We're only able to quantify six of the nine. And together with David Obora, who is here today as well, we have then three years back taken the plenty boundary science to a new level by launching the Earth Commission. And the Earth Commission has broadened the assessment to safe and just Earth system boundaries. So it's really moving continuously ahead and, and filling knowledge gaps in order to inform the world's ability to navigate the Anthropocene, the challenges we're facing when putting so much pressure on the planet. Thank you for that, Johan. I feel like, especially for youth climate activists, tipping points and planetary boundaries is something that we often talk about, but there's so much, it's so difficult to communicate. And one of the questions that we're always asked, and I think is a good question to start with our audience today as well, is once boundaries are crossed, is there a way back? And how can we protect the remaining three? Yeah, so, so that, and that's a really important question. So for each boundary in all scientific fields, there is a, a range of uncertainty. So we, we, we don't have the exact point when you cross a tipping point, but we have an uncertainty range. So for climate, for example, the safe planetary boundary is set at 350 ppm of CO2 concentration. But the uncertainty range is set between 350 and 450 ppm. I call this zone the, the danger zone. The zone when you go out of the safe space, cross 350, and enter a danger zone. We're now at 420 ppm. So we have passed the safe boundary. We're outside of safety. But we're not outside of the, of the uncertainty range in science, which is set at 450 ppm. And go beyond 450, you enter what I call the red zone the high-risk zone, and that is where we have higher scientific evidence that we can cause irreversible changes. But for climate, for example, we, are, we cannot uh, exclude irreversible changes, but we still have a range of uncertainty and thereby also a window to turn back. This is how we do for all the boundaries, but we are in the red for a few of them. So for loss of biodiversity, for overloading of nitrogen and phosphorus, for um, land use change and for overloading of chemicals, we're actually now assessing that we're in a high-risk zone. Is it too late to turn back even if you're in a high-risk zone on planetary boundaries? The answer is no. Uh, on, on most accounts, we see that there is a possibility to, to regenerate and then rebuild resilience. While, of course, again, David will emphasize that once you've lost a species or lost a core reef system or a major ecosystem, you, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to, to recuperate it. So one has to be very careful when being beyond boundaries, but it's not, it's not too late because you're outside of a boundary. It's, it's a warning sign that things start becoming dangerous and at risk of causing irreversible changes. So fundamentally, the safe boundaries stay within them, and we have a really good chance of avoiding crossing tipping points. Thank you, Johan. David? Uh, your organization supports sustainability of coral reef and marine systems in the Western Indian Ocean. And as we know, a key planetary boundary is ocean acidification. So thankfully, this is yet to be crossed, but can we expect it to stay this way for much longer? Uh, thanks, uh, Matisse. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be on here with, with you and with Johan and to pick up on some of the, the points that Johan has made. So I'll make two points on this, if I can. First, uh, you're right. So I work on coral reefs uh, in tropical... Um, uh, ocean settings, uh, and they're very sensitive to climate change and ocean acidification. Now, the ocean acidification boundary is one um, that you are specifically about. It's not the critical one yet for coral reefs in particular, um, though, though perhaps for some other marine systems. And the findings in the latest paper on the ocean acidification boundary is that we are just marginally within that boundary. I think just one, you know, one point off the boundary, um, which is not a very safe place to be in. Um, so while we haven't crossed it yet, um, can we expect it to stay this way for much longer? If we continue, you know, the drivers um, of, of climate change and acidification, which is principally the carbon dioxide emissions, we can expect to cross that boundary very soon. Um, and, you know, unless we turn off the drivers and the pressures that drive us across these boundaries, we will cross them in the end. We will go into that uncertainty zone or the danger zone that Johan mentioned 
and then progress to towards the other side uh, and out of the danger zone and, and way past those boundaries. Now, the, but the thing that has really affected coral reefs globally uh, to date has been temperature. Um, and this is the, the climate boundary um, that results from, from CO2 in the atmosphere and the greenhouse uh, warming effect. And we're finding now that that boundary for coral reefs, um, you know, we're probably, um, we, we haven't identified these boundaries for, for specific ecosystems, but coral reefs are very sensitive. Um, and at close to one and a half degrees warming now globally, we have such widespread impacts on coral reefs that they are, they are declining very rapidly in many parts of the world. There are some regions that are showing incredible resilience uh, and some adaptation and resistance to these high temperatures in some species of corals. But the ecosystem as a whole is, is really decimated by the progressive losses that we see. Um, and as Jörn has mentioned, you know, extinction is permanent for species. Once you lose a species, it's gone forever. You can deplete a species down to very low levels. And if you put in place the right conservation uh, and restoration, practices, you can get it back. Uh, some ecosystems, you can restore some ecosystems, but the, a big question is whether you can really restore the full functions uh, that those ecosystems have. And for coral reefs, I'm afraid the signs are that we are pushing them so far across um, the, the thresholds of decline that uh, we really need to pull back on the drivers of decline as quickly as we can. And that's CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. We have to bring them back as rapidly as possible to stay within the boundaries uh, for, for coral reefs to survive and other tropical marine systems. Thank you so much, David. I come from the Philippines where I've seen how the coral reefs and the marine systems have really degraded over time, both because of climate change, but also because of um, human activity. And so I guess the next question is, what should we be doing better to support our marine systems, both um, on a policy level, but also on the scientific and research level? Well, so marine systems, especially the these inshore uh, coastal systems that we're talking about, uh, coral reefs, and then of course mangroves are very important seagrasses to tropical uh, countries. Uh, they sustain a lot of people, um, but they are very vulnerable to many different pressures. So climate change is one of them, but there's also a lot of land-based pressures. They're right at the boundary of, of all the water flow that comes out of the rivers and groundwater into the sea um, affects these inshore marine ecosystems. Um, so they're very vulnerable to that. And then of course, to fishing and resource use and other direct uh, pressures from people. Um, and the closer waters are of course easier to get to. Um, so, so people exploit them first. So we really need to manage these multiple pressures uh, and reduce them that are affecting uh, marine ecosystems uh, across the board. It's very hard for local authorities or even countries to, to manage the climate pressure. That really needs multilateral efforts um, and, and global efforts through, through the climate convention. But then on fisheries, on pollution, um, on land-based development and so on, these pressures uh, need to be managed and reduced to sort of below threshold levels so that the resistance of the marine ecosystems is not being undermined. Now, the thing is, as um, you know, global population grows and the global economy grows, the, the coastal zones are attracting uh, people and economic development faster than any other um, zone uh, on the planet. People migrate to the coasts. It's where you can have you know, cheaper transport through shipping, comes in through coastal zones. So they are really experiencing all of these pressures much more quickly uh, than most other places. Um, and we need to put in place the policies um, to, to manage and reduce pressures. And we need to also invest in the science and the monitoring to really understand what's happening. And the monitoring is not just uh, scientific monitoring, it's also community-based and citizen science. There's a huge amount that can be done by stakeholders, by you know people living in coastal systems, in the ecosystems who have the greatest stake in maintaining them healthy. They can provide a lot of information, be very much involved in the decision-making processes to, uh, you know, to try and reduce these pressures uh, to to not cross the boundaries. Thank you, David. And I guess on that same note, my question is both for Johan and you, David. How can policymakers and governments better integrate the concept of planetary boundaries into their decision-making processes? I can start to give one one entry point to that, which uh, is a very 
pragmatic one, but also a necessary one, which is that if you think of it, where has policy come furthest when it comes to the planetary boundary, on planetary boundary action? And it's really on climate. It's it's on on the on the climate boundary. We have the Paris Agreement, it's a legally binding agreement. All countries in the world today essentially have um, an NDC plan. You have a majority of the countries even having net zero pathways. I mean, we're moving too slowly, but there's a there's, there's a clear policy mainstreaming in the area of climate. Biodiversity, fresh water, nitrogen, phosphorus, aerosols, land are, are kind of lagging behind, unfortunately. And I, I, I guess you would agree <clears throat> to that, David. But uh, we have so much scientific evidence, not least through the planetary boundary science, that you know, even if you care only on climate, if even if you have policy makers who only focus on solving the climate crisis, we now have unequivocal, really strong scientific evidence that even if you phase out fossil fuels, even if you do everything right on all the greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, short-lived climate forcers, and fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas, you would still fail. You would still crash through 1.5 degrees Celsius, the planet around our climate, and you would move towards 2 degrees Celsius if you do not get it right in nature, that you need to come back into the safe boundary on biodiversity loss, on land system change in particular. We cannot allow ourselves to continue letting the global agricultural system expand into intact nature because intact nature provides us within the order of 25% of carbon sink uptake 25 percent of the fossil fuel burning that we carry out every year is actually absorbed in intact nature on land so so that i think is one entry point here to to communicate that to put it simple nothing less than a planetary boundary framework needs to be implemented even if you only bother even if you're only focusing in on a safe climate landing and i think that is one one critical entry point. There, there are many others because the intrinsic value of, of nature is so high and so directly coupled to human well-being and economic development and equity. So, you know, you can you can argue straight, but I think that this is this is one of these pieces that I find is really missing also in in the climate agenda. That we think that it's only an energy transition, when in reality it's really a planetary boundary transition. Yeah, and if, if I can pick up from, from Johan's comments, and I, I think the value of the planetary boundaries concept in policy is that it's the concept is so understandable. It's something that's very familiar to us in ecology. We talk about carrying capacities of ecosystems. If you have too many individuals consuming too much, you, you, you put the system out of balance and you can impose you know, really strong uh, instabilities on an ecosystem by doing that. And I think it's it's a very clear concept at the planetary level that, that there are boundaries um, to what the planet can sustain because nature is a, is a finite thing. Um, so really understanding that I think is, is very important. Now, the difficulty for governments and for policymakers is bringing that down to national contexts, of course, because they all um, operate within their national contexts uh, and then down to local scales. There's a lot of challenges in doing that and countries have very different takes on the planetary boundary concepts. Um, but I think pushing forward with really explaining um, the generality of the systems approach um, is going to be the power in the concept and where we can get more and more buy-in across them. I think one of the key innovations in the Earth Commission that Johan just mentioned as well is, is looking at the justice element of the planetary boundaries. It's not just about uh, what is the physical limit in terms of carbon or um, you know, food production or the amount of nature that is being consumed. But what is the justice element? Who, who is consuming and how much? What's the fair share among people um, that... Um, uh, that is relevant at this scale. And this is very clear in the case of climate justice now. It's increasingly clear for what we could call biodiversity justice as well um, and other elements of, of the Earth system too. So there's an equity that we need to, to identify and be able to use in decision-making about what our fair shares for people, but then also what's the fair shares of the drivers of decline uh, that have, uh, you know, been operating over historical scales, you know, and this is the idea of the 
polluters pays principle in other contexts. You know, who has who has driven us across this, these planetary boundaries and what do we need to do in terms of justly uh, pulling back within them and assuring fair shares across people. And then the last thing is the planetary boundaries concept is really strong in that, you know, the, the planet is a complex entity and the planetary boundaries concept identifies these nine different boundaries and they're interconnected. We need to, we can't just act on one. We need to act across multiple elements of the system to really um, drive balance uh, across the system in all these boundaries and in the people that are affected by um, by what's happening today and in the future. So I think there's great power in, in, in the process. It's complicated, but we're making great advances in communicating it so that policymakers can understand it and understand what are the constraints, but then what are the opportunities uh, that they can get from, from understanding these concepts and applying them. And, and, and Mitzi, let, let me just reinforce, if I may, one, one point that, that David made, that the system is finite. And, and I found my experience so far with the planetary boundary science and bridging to stakeholders in society is that that is really powerful because each boundary is, is absolute. It translates to a budget. Everyone understands a budget. And a budget translates to accounting. You can measure it, but you also need to distribute it in a fair way. So the climate boundary, 1.5 degrees Celsius, translates to a carbon budget, 500 gigatons of carbon, translates to a pathway to net zero, and translates to a distribution of that budget to different countries. It's the same with nitrogen. It's the same with phosphorus. It's the same with land, same with fresh water. And th this kind of budget thinking of how we, as, as humanity, fit within this finite, limited space on planet Earth is, is I think, what, what, what really is, is the bridge point between the, the academics and, and what we mean when we say we need to have a world that provides prosperity and equity within the safe operating space on Earth. Well, that safe operating space is really about accounting within finite budgets. It's quite, in a way, it's quite straightforward. I mean, it's not, it's not easy science, it's not easy quantifications, but it's quite straightforward. And David's point is key. How do you then scale that? How, how do you share a global budget in a fair way with, with, with nations, with companies, with cities, with communities? Thank you both. I feel like, especially in the space of youth climate activists, this is where a lot of our frustration comes from, where we listen to the science, we see it, and we see very clearly that there are fiscal limits. Like, as you said, nature is finite. There are boundaries to this planet. Yet we see our world leaders and our national leaders continue to do actions that seem to ignore that completely, or at least not recognize the finiteness of our resources in the planet. And, and picking up on what David said earlier, not seeing how everything is so interconnected, seeing things as almost like in a vacuum, and that certain issues, certain events, certain decisions won't affect the other um, parts of, of our planet as well. So to kind of counteract that frustration, I was wondering if either of you could share any successful case studies where nations or communities have managed to pull back from damaging or crossing a boundary. And I really hope you have some examples. Okay, I can start with that. So, so yes, so I'll take a very simple example uh, in, in a, you know, at the level of a city, say a municipality on the coastal zone. And what has been demonstrated time and time again um, in many developed countries, but also increasingly in developing countries now, is this issue of pollution. And if you have localized pollution and, you know, of industry and towns and sewage into bays and estuaries and then into coastal zones, it decimates that environment. It, it, it turns it into a really depauperate, polluted, um, sick environment that is bad for people and is bad for economies and so on. But in that system, if you if you put in restorative practices, if you take away the drivers of decline, so you control the pollution, uh, you, you, you make companies and cities and households and businesses incorporate all the costs of not polluting the environment into what they do, and then you, you can restore ecosystems as well. Within, uh, within 10 or 20 years, you can really turn that system around so it's clean. People can go swimming in the water again. You know, you have innumerable stories of dolphins coming into the shoreline, which they weren't doing 20 or 30 years beforehand. You could eat the fish, you know, so you can have small scale and artisanal fisheries. So that's a very small scale system of, of where a boundary has been crossed, um, which is in a way like the planetary boundaries. We're, you know, we're talking, you have biodiversity, you have, you have 
uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and you have all these other dimensions where you act on one that is really driving the decline, you can, you can have improvements across that system. So that's a very simple one. You can have the same with fisheries and, and natural you know, uh, living resources because nature has phenomenal powers of regeneration if you maintain the system intact and if you give it a chance. Getting out to larger scale, of course, is, 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 much, more, is much more difficult, but I think we need to understand that the planet is a system and it does have regenerative powers if we give it a chance, if we, if we pull these drivers back. So perhaps I'll stop with that one. Johan will probably have a, uh, a good example. No, but that, that, that's a, we, we had really not uh, prepared this, uh, Mitzi, but it's, it's a perfect combination because David gives, gives, a, gives a regional local example. Let me then kind of complement that with a global example. So among the nine boundaries, there, there's one which is in the green, and that is the depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer. Many people tend to have, you know, forgotten the fact that, you know, in the early 1980s, we were actually facing an existential threat because of the emissions of chlorofluorocarbons, the freons that we used, chemicals that were used at the time as cooling agents in air conditioners and spraying bottles and refrigerators, which was uh, destroying the protective ozone layer up in the stratosphere, high up in the, in the higher atmosphere that protects the planet from, from dangerous levels of UV radiation. I mean, basically threatening the livability of large parts of particularly the Southern hemisphere. Now, science identified not only the ozone hole, but also um, was able to explain that we were causing it through the chemical reactions between ozone and, and, the, and the CFCs. It gave a Nobel Prize to, uh, um, in 1995 to Mario Molina and Paul Crutzen and, um, and Sherwood Rowland. And um, policy listened, which is quite remarkable. Science uh, was, was listened upon. Policy acted in 1987, the Montreal Protocol, was signed as a global legally binding agreement. So we acted collectively as, as humanity and industry engaged and innovated and, um, and developed um, less ozone threatening chemicals. And um, it took us then 25 years. And now we have the, the first um, observation showing that the ozone hole is, is closing in and, and we're protected again. So it kind of ties to your first question there also. Are we, what happens if we are outside of the safe space? Can we return back? Well, this is not only an example of a return, it's an example of a global collective action, and it's an example of the world listening to science and acting on the science. And I sometimes tell my students, nobody has ever seen an ozone hole. We, we trusted the knowledge. We trusted the facts. We didn't have to have a disaster hitting us, we, we proactively deviated from disaster. And that's exactly the point we are at today. We cannot allow all the coral reef systems or the green ice sheet to cross tipping points because then it's too late. You know, it's, it's, you cannot wake up after the fact when it comes to the planet. We simply have to turn around before the fact. And, and I think therefore the, the, the ozone whole story is, is, is one example that we need to, um, uh, basically be inspired by when it comes to dealing with the other boundaries. Thank you so much to the both of you. I really appreciate that local to regional to global example of solutions. I, it does give me hope to know that, you know, we can do something. And we, can, we say that a lot, right? We always say that there is more that we can do. But it's always sometimes a bit hard to find those concrete examples. And so my next question is for David, but you know, if you have answers for this as well. Uh, I wanted to ask if there are any innovative solutions or technologies that either of you are excited about in terms of either marine systems or the planetary boundaries. I think, to be honest, I'm going to I'm going to play the card that the innovations that we need are in are in values and practice and governance, if to stay within planetary boundaries, um, because. So I work in coral reefs and I'm, I'm a basic ecologist. I go in the water and I, I, I look at corals and I count them and so on. And there's many more innovative techniques now that are out there. Um, and they will do a lot in terms of particularly going towards restoration, understanding how we can try and bring coral reefs back or try and, and, and restore function in places. But my fear is that the, the speed at which that sort of innovation happens is too slow. 
uh, for the system that we're looking at. And that if we go too far outside of these planetary boundaries, we will we will lose the coral reefs, they'll go past their tipping point. So we won't be able to bring them back. Um, and the, the critical innovation we need right now is to really understand that the, the, the full values of nature and that those full values are incorporated into the, into the economic value systems that we have, into the decision-making systems. How do you make sure that you maintain the multiple benefits from a, a beautiful coastal area? I'm looking out at the sea where I'm sitting right now. How do you maintain all these benefits, even though maybe only 20% of them uh, can be monetized um, and can you know be counted as fish or the value of coastal property or tourism and things like that because there are many others, and I think that innovation is what where we need to go very soon. I think uh, so. I'm I've recently um, been appointed as the chair of IFBES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity biodiversity and ecosystem services. And I think one of the main threads that the IFBES science has been pushing towards is is of inclusion. So just by making sure that you're making decisions fully inclusively of the people that are affected by a problem and with the multiple value systems that those people may have, just by including the multiple value systems, we will make much better and more integrated decisions about, about pathways forward. Um, and of course, some of the value systems are much more eco-oriented. Some do more damage to the to the environment. So we need to sort of, you know, downplay the latter and and increase the former. But but that governance and that inclusion, I think, is is the fastest thing we can do because that's just behavior change. We can do it tomorrow if everybody buys into that. Um, but it takes you know 10, 20, 30, 40 years for technological innovations to really come through and scale up to scale that we need. So, so I'm going to really push for that because that's what we need in Africa. That's what we need across many parts of Asia, rather than sort of high tech innovations that really do take so long to upscale and, and put out at, a, at an economic price in, into the markets and to all the spaces where they may be needed. I completely agree. It really is about that political will as well from our political leaders to ensure that these mechanisms and these policies are put into space. That way, that behavioral change also becomes easier. Johan, is there something that you would like to add to? If not, I do have another question for you. Yeah, let, let me just say, I, I fully agree with, with David here. And uh, what, to be honest, what, what really worries me today, probably worries me more than anything, is that we have so much evidence that we need trust and collective action, which means governance at the at the global level, more than ever, in a situation where the levels of trust and our ability our ability to act collectively is 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 lower, probably in the lowest mark since we established you know the Bretton Woods institutions after the Second World War. So we're kind of at an all time low on trust and institutional capacity when we need it most. And and that to me is 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 where the big innovation space is. So not not silver bullets on technologies, but systematic efforts of, of how do we actually break through on on distrust and misinformation and, and efforts of trying to get to collective action. But I should I would say though that we identify in the work at the Potsdam Institute two two transformations that would you know, not bring us entirely into the safe space, but but to a very significant extent. And of course, one is the energy transition. So to basically get off oil, gas and coal and, and transition into a, a green energy future for humanity. But the second one is the food system transformation. And the food system transformation is is really challenging, but it's also very exciting because the solutions are are largely there. We we have scalable solution for for sustainable, regenerative, healthy food systems that can give better equity, better access of food, but also um, moving us towards you know solving overloading of nutrients, overloading of fertilizers, overloading of pesticides, overconsumption of fresh water, expansion of land into natural ecosystems is essentially entirely due to agriculture. So, you know, we it, it's not as if we're not sitting with with um, let's say with with good options here. So if you can if you can combine the innovation space that David shared with the systems innovations on practices, I, I think that's that's a that's a quite a nice spot to to be in if we really want to accelerate and, and scale. 
Yeah, and if I can add one more thing to that, because because I'm glad you know, Johan made it much more tangible as well, is that I think one of the innovations where we can really move forward is in the information um, innovations mm -hmm. we have. I mean, our ability to combine information is so much larger now than even five mm -hmm. years ago or two <clears> years ago. And this is where, you know, we don't have to only count money and GDP anymore. We can count apples and oranges and fish and coral reefs and mangrove trees and really balance all this information to understand what decisions should be taken. So I think that's real information and decision uh, innovation is, is really we're at the cusp of that and investing in that, I think, will really help. And that, of course, needs that trust uh, and that uh, belief in the system um, that, that Johan mentioned at the beginning as well. Thank you both. Something that I often say is that the way that we view development just in GDP and just in numbers and just in profit is one of the reasons why we've been so removed from the earth and the boundaries. And we see them as natural resources to use versus as people and humans being part of the ecosystem, um, which is something that has been taught to us ever since we were children, right? Like humans are part of the biodiversity, part of the ecosystem, but it seems the way that we've been acting around it is that we're separate from it. It is something to govern versus something that we are a part of. And I really hear you both on that international collaboration, especially with the UN Climate Summit happening at the end of this month, at the end of November. Hopefully we do have more push towards that energy transition, especially with that equitable mindset. Uh, so I guess that is a question that I have for the both of you. What are your expectations or hopes or demands or what would you like to see from the upcoming UN climate summit at the end of the month so so I have um, I basically two two expectations it's not even hopes because we cannot continue hoping anymore we really have to put put the pressure on uh, on global policymakers to to start really delivering on the Paris agreement so number one is that th this this must become the big mitigation cop um we have so many topics on the agenda but we've come a long way and i think we should celebrate the fact that the paris agreement is essentially negotiated all the text is in place we have certainly not implemented on article 6 and loss and damage and adaptation and finance but it's all there and and we've now come to a point where ipcc is very clear if we don't bend the global curve of fossil fuel emissions within the next two years, we, we shut the door to 1.5, which is not a target, it's a limit, because beyond that, we really enter danger zones in terms of risk of crossing tipping points. So COP28, uh, and, I, and I'm talking well beyond myself here, because I hear this all the time. I came this Friday from the last European Union climate stock take in the European Commission, and I sat down with the new Commissioner Vopke Höxtra. He's newly appointed, he's replacing Franz Timmermans, but I can tell you, he was absolutely crystal clear. We simply have to start getting serious on bending the curve on oil, gas, and coal. And we have a golden opportunity in Dubai because Sultan Al Jaber and the UAE and the whole community in the presidency are sitting right at the center of, of the fossil fuel industry in the world and they have a golden opportunity to be trusted conveners of of commitments credible commitments to start that journey so i really hope to be honest i really hope that in the midst of of all the of all the really important topics that also needs to be at the forefront particularly on finance equity adaptation and continue the work on loss and damage that we that we have a breakthrough on, on mitigation, on on the on the decarbonization and the phase out of fossil fuels. So that's that's number one. But the second is actually to to integrate the planetary boundary agenda into the climate agenda. We simply have to have nature center stage in Dubai because it's part of the mitigation. You know that that's the key issue. It's uh, without nature, we will also fail on on holding. The carbon and the methane and the nitrous oxide stably in in the biosphere. So it's a it's it's dual. But um, but if I would put if you would force me to to kind of hold on to one item, it would be the mitigation agenda for for this COP for this COP. I mean I I'm totally with you on on the width of the agenda, but for this COP. So I guess I'll try and pick up from that. Um, so I think I would I would 
mention two things, and they and they echo some of what Johan has 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 just said. The first is commitment. Um, I mean, I've been to or around multiple climate cops, and and the commitment to to pledges has has been insufficient at, at all counts. And from Africa, we're very very conscious of that, particularly on finance and so on. So, and Johan used the term bending the curves. So I've just come from the, the biodiversity COP last year at the end of uh, 2022, when we adopted or countries negotiated and adopted the global biodiversity framework. And we talk a lot about bending the curves of biodiversity decline. So we can, nature can be in a better place in the future than it is in now. Um, and and what I was not hearing enough about was bending the curves of the drivers of biodiversity decline, and that's and climate change. Energy and fossil fuels is a principal one of that, as are you know uh, land use and, and clearing and agricultural systems and so on. So we absolutely must bend the curves on these drivers of decline. And COP twenty eight is critical for delivering that for for climate change uh, because of this you know two two year window we have, as Johan just said. So that's that's the first thing. Also from Africa, you know, we, we really need to have uh, commitments on finance, understanding that, you know, finance, we, we need to reinvest in nature. It's not as if um, overseas aid or the finance that needs, needs to go into natural systems is from new money. This is this is wealth that was taken out of nature and put into manufactured goods and and, and put in bank accounts and, and, and reinvested in various places. We need to reinvest that back into nature. Um, and that's critical for for governments to understand that. The second thing is that biodiversity, yes, does need to be center stage. Uh, the mitigation role of biodiversity is, is essential, as Johan has indicated, but also in many parts of the world and for people who are uh, low income uh, communities, uh, for many farming systems, for fishing, for uh, people living in forests, a lot of the the assets that they have or much of the wealth that they have is resides in nature. And so nature is critical for adaptation and resilience, particularly in a changing climate. And so we really need to, to make sure that the climate COP and the climate process is moving forward, really fully, um, fully incorporate the um, biodiversity needs and what nature can do and what nature is needed for and to rebuild that. So that's the, the term in the climate space is nature-based solutions. In the biodiversity space, many countries are very... Um, wary of that term because it's been misused and misapplied in the past and they prefer ecosystem-based approaches uh, as a term to use but essentially they mean the same thing they mean making sure that nature is healthy so it can provide the solutions that we need for food for water uh, for climate resilience you know for transportation all sorts of things and so biodiversity really being at the core and i would hope that it, it can't happen at uh, at the cop yet but in further processes leading forward that these various um, policy processes around climate, biodiversity, uh, the SDGs and all the different uh, institutions for the goals around the SDGs, they need to connect much more. They need to integrate so that actions are coherent across them and they're not working across purposes because only with that will we really be able to depend all of these curves um, that are driving the declines uh, and to turn that around. Thank you so much, David and Johan. You have both made it very, very clear. And thank you for talking to me today about this critical issue. And so evidence scientific research is really crucial in our journey to tackle climate change. And collectively, we must do as much as possible to build awareness around the latest findings and also put pressure, as, as our two scientists have said today, on our political leaders, especially during key international moments. And I also just wanted to take note and um, honor that our last PCAG conversation was actually with Professor Salim Ofuk, who has since passed, and his contributions to loss and damage, adaptation, and really championing the most marginalized and the most vulnerable in the climate crisis has done a lot for the climate justice work. And so we honor and we, we hope to continue that legacy um, in the years to come. And to everyone watching at home, thank you. Please help spread the word and encourage climate action and climate justice and that connection with nature, that reinvestment with nature and climate justice and equity by sharing our conversation with your networks. See you next time.